Hey everyone, it is Tuesday, September 10th. It's the day of Apple's next iPhone event. We are going to be watching along. We would welcome you to join us. We're going to be doing our usual commentary, our color, our analysis. We have a live chat room with us. So uh, sit back, relax, enjoy, and let's watch Apple throw out some new iPhones. This is the iMore Show. So Peter Cohen is going to join me momentarily. Apple should be starting in about 12 minutes, so we have a little bit of time to get started. We're going to be putting text up below this video so that people who can't watch can still um, listen. So excuse any of us if we have to stop to type every once in a while when something major happens. We're going to continue talking throughout. Um, I have some live blogs behind me, The Verge and, and Gadget. It does not look like Apple will be streaming the event. Um, so this is all going to be meta. It's all going to be by proxy. Uh, but, you know, that's okay. That's fun. We get to do this together. Instead of being locked away in a small little room, we, quite frankly, get to enjoy ourselves in a huge tailgate party. Um, things should be kicking off in about 10 minutes. It looks like they have brought journalists into Apple's town hall. Um, I'm just going to give Peter the link so he can join us. And... Uh, it's a small venue. Apple's Town Hall is approximately 150 seats, I think, and that has got to include all the pertinent people from Apple uh, who are running the show, doing the show, and intimately involved in the show. So if you are watching and following along, if you are in our chat, we are at imore.com slash iPhone dash event. And we have both a meta live blog running and a full open comment running. So you can basically just enjoy the show along with us. Um, once again, there is no uh, stream. Apple does not always do streams for their event. And the last time they were in uh, Town Hall for the iPhone 4S event, they did not do a stream either. So it is not unprecedented. Um, hello to everybody in the chat room. Thank you so much for joining us. Wow, we got thousands of people in the chat room. That is fantastic. You guys rock. Um, again, Peter Cohen will be joining me shortly. Oh, Peter's here. Hi, Peter. Hello. Peter Cohen, the executive editor of The Loop, loopinsight.com, the managing editor of iMore, and as I like to call him, general internet bon vivant. <laughs> Hi, Renee. Hello, viewers. Are you wearing listeners. your gold chain in, uh, in in brotherhood to the gold iPhone, Peter? Um, what's that? Are you wearing a gold chain in brotherhood with the gold iPhone? No, this is uh, th this is steel, man. Oh, okay. So it's for the steel iPhone. That's right. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a graphite iPhone any day of the week over gold. So I was just telling people there does not look like there's it does not look like there's going to be a live stream this year. And two years ago when they did the iPhone 4S event at the same town hall venue, there was no live stream either. Well, you know, I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing. I'm not sure if there's something specific about the venue that prevents them from doing it or makes it logistically more difficult to do it. Excuse me for just a moment. Do you think there's any truth but, to the rumor uh, that Dalrymple attenuates the signal? You know, I I know that for a fact, having covered shows with him before, that he definitely does. So that could be a factor. Um, but uh, no, in all seriousness, I mean, you know, it, it's a shame that that they're not live uh, uh, that that they're that they're not live streaming it. On the other hand, that's great for us because it means that many more of you will be uh, sticking with us for our uh, our live play-by-play -play coverage of the event. You know, absolutely, and you know, I, I mean, I've watched live blogs, and I've, I've done live blogs. Ironically, I've done live blogs for BlackBerry, for Samsung, for Sony, uh, for LG, and for every other company not named Apple. Uh, and it's one thing to just transcribe what they're saying, but I actually like this because we can, as they're saying it, um, we can just provide the, the, the sort of color and commentary and analysis that I think adds value. It's almost like sports commentary at this point. Exactly. Now, which one of us is uh, Madden, and which one of us is L. Michaels? You didn't make me Don Cherry? 
I don't know whether to be flattered <laughs> or insulted. Oh yeah, that's right. Hockey night in Canada. That's right. It's that it's awesome. iPhone day around the world. I need a louder shirt. I was just gonna say neither of us are dressed appropriately to be John Cherry. Although I, I think I'm closer to his hairstyle and his facial hair. Probably, and you probably know much more about hockey than I do, having the Bruins <laughs> so close by. <laughs> you got no excuse. You got the Habs nearby. Yeah, it's about a six-week season for the Habs. It's great. Yeah, there you go. So, Peter, um, right off the bat, some people are wondering when we're going to get the Macs, the Haswell, iMac, Mac Mini, um, Retina MacBook Pros. Are we expecting them for this event? We are not expecting them. My bet is that we'll see them sometime in October. Um, but th this event, as far as I can tell, should be specific um, to... Uh, iOS and and more specifically probably just for the iPhone, but um, you know it, 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 an October release would be keeping with annuals more or less annual uh, upgrade cycle uh, for new Mac hardware, and it would also peg it um, pretty close to Apple's quarterly financial report, uh, which again is also uh, if past as prologue, as I'm fond of saying, a good indication that Apple would release new Mac hardware somewhere, somewhere around then so they can get all that revenue reported uh, for, the, uh, for the coming quarter. Now, we're also not expecting iPads at this event. That has been pseudo-officially noped uh, by Jim as well, and I haven't heard anything about it either. Right, exactly. Um, you know, there, there's, there's an outside ballpark chance that we might hear something about Apple TV today, either a software update or um, it, ostensibly a hardware refresh is in the works, but as you pointed out on our iMore I'm Show uh, podcast before, Rene, probably premature for this announcement. Um, and yeah, we certainly should be hearing some stuff about iOS 7 today. iOS 7 is so close, so close to release, we should be definitely hearing some, um, some, some stuff. Yeah, and uh, iOS. I mean, the Apple TV does run iOS. It will be getting iOS seven. Apple won't call it that. They use a bunch of weird names for it instead of uh, I forget they called Apple TV OS six point something or other. But it really is iOS seven below the covers. I don't know if they're going to do an iOS seven style visual refresh for the interface though. You know, I, that would certainly be nice. I think the uh, uh, the Apple TV uh, interface is getting sort of old and tired. Um, it'd be really cool to see it, and it'd be nice to see it have some consistency uh, with iOS 7, because let's face it, up until now, the, the Apple TV interface has been very, very different uh, from the, the conventional iOS interface. I'd love to see some consistency there, uh, but, you know, I, I'm not a UX expert either, so I don't know really what that means for the Apple TV. Well, the Apple TV is getting hard to handle now with so many different channels, and some of them, you know, like the Disney ones, quite hideous to look at. That is very true. I, you know, it's funny. I, uh, I had cause to reset my Apple TV. I've got a second-gen Apple TV, the first black box, um, and I, I had cause to reset it about a week ago, and I had to go back in and log into all the apps like Netflix and Disney XD and Crunchyroll and so on, um, and I, I was appalled actually at how inelegant it, it really handled the whole process. You know, I, I hope that um, that that for users' sake, Apple is do something doing something to improve the Apple TV UI because it's getting a little clunky. Yeah, and historically, I mean, there was a guy who left the Apple TV t team and said that Steve Jobs never liked that interface, which is why they never used it uh, in previous years. And while it did, I mean, it did make some things easier to get to, It's there's still no search across different channels. Uh, there's still no sane way to organize the channels. It's just, it's not as good an Apple experience as the iPhone or iPad yet. This is true, and let me tell you, if you're using an Apple TV and you don't have a Bluetooth keyboard and you find yourself having to enter searches in YouTube or any other service that you use on the Apple TV and you're tired of punching in individual numbers, do yourself a favor and get one of these. Get an Apple wireless key uh, Bluetooth keyboard or a Bluetooth keyboard that works with, the, with, with any um, uh, Apple device, whether it's Mac or iOS, should work just fine. Uh, it has completely changed the way that I use my Apple TV. It really has improved things greatly. 
Yeah, it's just I would hope that eventually Apple will solve that problem without us having to have a little aluminum chiclet rectangle box next to us on the sofa. You know, I'm not sure that there's anything that Apple's going to be able to do about that because we want to enter search fields. You know, we want to enter search to search stuff. And I mean, even on my PlayStation 3, for example, if I'm searching for stuff, it's easier to do it with the Bluetooth keyboard uh, linked to the device than it is to do it with um, with with you know, a remote control pounding out uh, yeah. uh, letters and numbers. So from that perspective, I, I, I think that there's a limited amount that Apple can do, but uh, I certainly wouldn't mind seeing a better integrated remote, not necessarily from Apple, but maybe a third party, um, something akin to a Logitech Harmony or even the TiVo keyboards that have like a flip-up design or the TiVo uh, remotes that have a flip-up design with a keyboard underneath. That would be cool too. Yeah, it's an interesting problem to crack. Now, we are expecting the iPhone 5S, uh, which will be the new high-end iPhone, an iteration on the iPhone 5, probably in gold, maybe in steel, with a better Apple A5, uh, sorry, A7 uh, processor, a better camera, you know, probably more energy efficient, uh, and a fingerprint scanner so that if Peter picks up my iPhone at a bar, he can't make any rude tweets while my back is turned. Indeed, indeed, yeah. I, you know, the fingerprint scanner is something that's gotten a lot of eyebrows raised um, since uh, news started to leak out a couple of weeks ago about it. And, you know, for my part, I think it's great, but I've got some fundamental questions about how um, this is going to affect things like authentication and stuff like that that uh, I, I guess we'll see, you know, what exactly happens um, as time goes on. No, absolutely, and it's going to be one of those things where first Apple has to make a case. It, it, they have to say it's easier and faster to use than a PIN code, for example, and then they're going to have to prove that it's reliable because if people have Siri moments, uh, you know, they'll probably stop using it, and that would be a shame because the whole point of this is to make authentication easier on mobile. Yeah, indeed, and you know, I, the, 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 the most valid questions that I've heard um, so far come from... Um, uh, IT people who are responsible for supporting whole bucket loads of these things. It's like, yes. hey, how is this going to work? You know, because I need, I need to be able to reset these things, or I need to be able to lock them out, or make changes at the drop of a hat. Um, so I, I'm sure Apple has thought about those issues. I'm sure Apple's got some great solutions for us. But it, the, the proof of the pudding, of course, is in, is in the eating. It's going to be very interesting to see. Very interesting to see how this stuff. Uh, um, evolves um, as as we uh, we find out more about the technology. All right. It looks like a lot of the uh, the the all the journalists are in place. The event is about to start. They're playing fits and the tantrums, according to our old friend Dieter Bone, uh, who is dutiously typing it all out for the Verge today. Um, there's a lot of outlets covering it. So while Apple is not doing a live stream, we can at least collect, sort of um, compile all the information and hopefully hopefully give it to you in an enriched form, in like enriched adamantium. <laughs> Peter, do you think there'll be any surprises? Do you think there'll be any one more things? Do you think they'll pull that old line out and give us one more shock? Nope. That was a Steve Jobs thing, and Steve didn't even do that for years after he had done it before. I think that, uh, and, and I, I, I don't see Tim Cook really playing by that rule book either. I'm not expecting a lot of surprises today. Having said that, I think that there's a lot about the iPhone 5S and 5C that we don't already know, uh, even though we think we might. I mean, we've seen parts, we've seen uh, cases, we've seen complete boxes, and we've seen... Uh, we, we sort of have a glimpse of what, what is going on here, but I don't think we really have the full picture yet. So I think that there is certainly room for Apple to surprise and delight us with this announcement today. All right, so Tim Cook has taken the stage. He looks to be wearing his traditional button-down black shirt. He looks to be doing that grimacy smile of his. Um, and the event is underway. They've got the circles that, they've gone to those circles a lot, Peter. They used that at the WWDC event. They've used it for past iPad events. It's interesting to see. Yeah, I don't exactly understand what the um, significance of the circles is, but you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting motif, that's for sure. So Cook, I'm guessing, and I think we'll find this out pretty soon, he is, I'm guessing that he is going to talk about the numbers, about Apple's business, about its core values, He's starting off with iTunes Festival in its seventh year, and that's a, a free channel, right? You can access that on your Apple TV, 
and on your um, iOS devices. Yeah, I mean, iTunes Festival has been going on for a few years now. It's a, it's a, a month-long event that happens in the UK. Uh, Apple gets uh, top-billed um, uh, entertainers to, to perform at concerts every night. And uh, now Apple is really starting to, to, to push it out as, as a major entertainment channel. And I think it's very smart for them to do that, and I'm really happy to see them do it. And it, it's certainly, I mean, they've got some acts on there that I'm really thrilled to, to, to check out. Yeah, and he's showing off Elton John, Jack Johnson, Lady Gaga, Justin Timberlake, Katy Perry, John Legend, Robin Thicke. Oh, the Thicke family continued. <laughs> Canada's, uh, one of Canada's top entertainment exports to the United States. You huh? know, you, you have to give it to us. We are smart. We did send you the Bieber. We did send you the Thicke. I mean, we get them out of our country fast. Yeah, Celine Dion, you managed to exile her. You know, yep. it's... We had Shania Twain out for a while, too. William Shatner. We want him back, actually. He's, he's curmudgeonly and funny now. <laughs> you, should, you should try to make him PM. Now, this is Apple's traditional music event slot. I mean, before um, the iPhone joined last year, this was the iPod plus iTunes music event. That's absolutely right, yeah. So music has always played a very important part in the September event. Yeah, Tim Cook says it's in Apple's DNA. Last year, it was almost like two events in one. There was the iPhone event, and then you could almost have had an intermission, and then the iPod event, and that was, I think, when Tim Cook actually said, music is in our DNA, and we have some products to show you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll see iPods this year. Do you think they'll show them off? Will they get press released? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I You know, I, I guess... It, it, it follows that whatever happens with the iPhone also has to happen with the iPod uh, Touch because the iPod Touch and the iPhone more or less stay in lockstep with each other in terms of functionality and capabilities outside of the obvious stuff like, you know, being a phone. Um, so uh, I, I, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I, a lot of people are wondering what's going to happen with the iPod Classic. You know, and personally, I would like to know that too. I'm looking for a really high capacity iPod Touch to replace the iPod Classic. Apple could thrill me today by offering me a hundred and uh, uh, well, I guess it would have to be, you know, a 256 gigabyte. Uh, iPod Touch. Ooh, boy, that would be fun. <laughs> well, I mean, Apple hasn't always updated. I remember one year, I think it was 2011, my iPod Touch review was, this year it comes in white. <laughs> there we go. So, uh, I mean, it, it, the iPod Touch theoretically used to have two, double the chipset of the iPhone, uh, and but they haven't been keeping that up to speed. Otherwise, we'd have got 128 gigabyte version a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's true. Um, and, you know, I, there are practical considerations for it as well. You know, obviously the cost of memory is pretty high uh, still, even though Apple has, you know, such a corner on that market. And also um, the iPod uh, Touch needs to stay a little bit slimmer than the iPod, I mean, than the iPhone does. So um, uh, there isn't quite as much room uh, for storage capacity in there. They're showing a video of the iTunes Festival. It is about the only imagery of... Uh, Lady Gaga, I've seen recently where she's clothed, so thanks, Apple, for that. Indeed. You know, Jim Dalrymple was at that event. <laughs> nice. I didn't realize he was a Gaga fan, but, you know. Uh, Jim is a man of mystery. He likes Heineken. Yeah, it's, a Canadian who likes Heineken is a rare breed indeed. <laughs> and the Bruins. I'm not going to bring that up again. <laughs> Uh, so, um, all, definitely iPhones, maybe iPods Touch. Is it iPods Touch, like Surgeon's General? I'm sure it is for some grammarians, but I think iPod Touches is perfectly sufficient in this particular case. All right, if there's any sticklers out there, you can address your concerns to Jed Bartlett. Um, Tim Cook is now updating us on retail. He's really been focused on this in the last few events. Um, he spent some time, he's even shown videos of marquee stores, especially in Europe, opening up. Indeed, indeed. Now, the interesting thing is, as I understand it, right now he's talking about the U.S. specifically, but obviously, uh, you know, Apple has been increasing its retail footprint abroad. And one particular area that Apple's very interested in reaching out to is China, because there have been a number of copycat stores that have popped up from quasi uh, Apple retailers that, you know, have really tried to, yeah. uh, you know, uh, button down the, the look and feel of the Apple store and very crafty and some would say trademark infringing ways. Yeah, and uh, there 
is no live stream um, video. Once again, no live stream video. Uh, you have to follow along from home. If anyone tells you they're live streaming it, either they are not being truthful or they will be caught by Apple and given the boot, which has happened in years past. Yep. So, uh, Apple retail, Peter. I, I ha you work in an Apple specialist, not exactly Apple retail, but it looks like they are doing um, a bang up job at supporting customers. Yeah, absolutely. Apple retail is great, and I have to admit, even as somebody who works in an Apple specialist retailer on the weekends, I'll go to Apple stores to get support um, uh, for products that I need to have repaired, for example, or whatever, because their support is so damn good. Plus, I just like the experience of going to an Apple store, even though it can be a little bit crowded and so on. The only problem is that Apple's uh, and this isn't actually a problem. This is a good problem to have. Apple is very interested in keeping um, uh, the, the, the dollars per square foot high uh, in all of its stores. So it's very choosy about where it opens locations. The, the malls that it opens into, the, the lifestyle centers as they're called now, uh, need to fit a certain demogra demographic profile for Apple to even consider putting a store in there. Uh, because once they put a store in, they're very reluctant to close it. They typically keep these locations open for quite some period of time. It's not unprecedented for an Apple store to open, but it is a little bit unusual. Um, so it's, you know, it's it, that that leaves room for companies like mine, you know, that 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 can service customers away from where Apple retail stores is because st stores are. Because, like in our case, we're still an hour's drive from the closest retail store. So. A lot of people prefer to come to us because they want to shop local, uh, they want to do uh, business with local companies, and they don't want to have to drive all that way to have to go to an Apple store. So uh, some people are saying they're having trouble with the iPhone event page. Um, I apologize if that is happening. We are taking a, a look at it now. Um, so uh, they're on to iOS 7, and Craig Federici is taking the stage. This will probably be a recap of WWDC, where he'll go over the same tentpole features that we saw previously, like Control Center, Notification Center, um, and the new look and the new feel. That's not uncommon, Peter. I wonder if they don't think the same people watch this event as watch WWDC, even though it's probably a lot of the same reporters in the room. Probably a lot of the same reporters in the room, but I'm not sure that a lot of the same people worldwide are, are really interested in the same information. You know, it's really interesting. Tim Cook just mentioned that they just shipped their 700 millionth iOS uh, product. Uh, earlier this year, it was only January, where he said that they had shipped 500 million. Uh, and if you think about iOS as existing since uh, 2007, that definitely shows that Apple's run rate um, on iOS products is increasing at quite a good pace. That's pretty surprising, and that's great news. Well, I mean, Horace Dedia has projected that they're going to hit a, um, a billion iPhone devices sold at some point, uh, either late this year or early next year. Yeah, I mean, based on what Tim Cook just said, it would probably be sometime early next year that they would hit that if um, the growth tracks linearly. Um, but, I, you know, moving into the holiday season, maybe we'll see a lot more people buying iOS devices. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, well, this I think this is why they moved the iPhone event to the fall. It's because it is their biggest single quarter. It's the holidays, and especially if they have a less expensive iPhone on tap, uh, that's something that will benefit hugely from uh, the increase. Absolutely. You know, a lot of eyes are on Beijing today, uh, later on uh, uh, this evening, when Apple does um, an announcement in China. We don't exactly know what they're going to announce, but the expectation is um, that Apple is going to roll out a... Uh, um, a, 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 a partnership with China Mobile, which is um, uh, a company that has more than 60% market share in a market of one point, almost 1.2 billion customers. Uh, if Apple gets into that market and Apple can start selling products through China Mobile, it's going to uh, increase iOS, uh, iOS's footprint worldwide dramatically. Yeah, again, some people are having problems. It looks like people are spamming the uh, the chat a bit. That might be causing it. We're working to fix it as quickly as possible. Craig Federici is showing his Twitter feed filled up with Lady Gaga tweets at the moment. So she's getting quite the bump from Apple. <laughs> well, Lady Gaga's awesome. I, I can understand why. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to soldier on. We might turn on moderation in the comments uh, if we have to. Uh, yeah, it looks like it's the core text bug. Um, I apologize for that, everybody. Um, so uh, going back to what's happening in the room now, he's talking about Siri. Uh, he's talking about the new Wikipedia, the Twitter feature, the inline web. Um, yes, yes. Uh, you know, and now and now you can uh, do web searches uh, uh, with with Siri. That's that you know that that's real cool. Uh, new ele uh, electronic uh, uh, music ringtones, um, uh, new notification sounds, which will be welcome to the people who are you know bored with their choices now. Um, you know, iOS seven is certainly shaming shaping up to have some nice polish on it. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I'm just turning on moderation in the chat, which sucks, but uh, people abuse things. This is why we can't have nice things. Um, there's new ringtones, apparently. Uh, they're showing off reminders, uh, the camera. I'm trying to keep up with this as best I can while we fix the chat room, at least uh, short term. There's uh, new effects in the camera app. Um, there uh, um, are, are live photo effects, uh, square aspect ratio. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Um, photos are grouped by location um, and, uh, and time as well. Um, th this is something that we had actually seen, if I recall correctly, out of WWDC earlier, but still it's a good reiteration to see. Uh, you know, I'm always surprised when uh, I'm working in the retail store and people come in with questions about their iPhone, which, ironically, we don't sell our support, but we try to help them anyway. Um, how many people use the iPhone as their, uh, their single device for photographs? And, uh, you know, they keep their entire life story. Uh, in the photo library of their iPhone. Many of them yeah. never even back it up to a computer. It's a little bit scary. Uh, but, you know, the, the, these, these devices, not just iPhones, but smartphones in general with, with, uh, with, with cameras attached to them, have, have become the replacement for, you know, the, the inexpensive point-and-shoot camera that, you know, just uh, 10 or 15 years ago it seemed like everybody had um, and would carry around with them to capture uh, precious moments. Um, you know, so it, I, I'm, I'm happy to see Apple plow a lot of innovation um, into the way that photos work um, uh, in, in iOS 7. AirDrop uh, photo sharing is another thing that's coming to iOS 7. Yeah, they're um, showing that off right now, the new share sheets. Yeah, the, that, that is really cool. Uh, the whole way that AirDrop works in iOS 7 is, uh, is really kind of neat. I just wish that uh, AirDrop worked between iOS 7 and OS 10. Yeah, that's it's it's interesting that it doesn't uh, because we've seen third-party apps do it. I'm guessing it's one of those things where Apple has a certain feature set they want to um, attain, and when they can't, they just would rather wait until they get it exactly the way they want it first. Yeah, you're probably right. You know, I, I and it gives it gives room for third parties to maneuver for now and hopefully uh, differentiate their products in the future when Apple finally gets around to backfilling. Uh, this this fun this this feature with with the functionality that uh, um, that those other apps are coming up with. The uh, uh, I, iOS seven music app is being shown off right now, and uh, you know it's uh, it's nice to hear uh, figuratively and literally uh, Apple doing cool things with uh, with music in iOS seven, including of course iTunes Radio, which we've all been waiting for. So just an update, yes, uh, some, some ne'er-do-wells were putting uh, the Cortex crash bug into the chat room uh, just to ruin it for everybody, but we've got a moderator in there now manually approving it. So we've got to do a bunch of onerous work just because people want to be dicks on the Internet. So I apologize to anybody who were affected by that, but it should for, be back to normal now. For whatever what's worth, though, we have dispatched a crack team of ninjas out to those individuals' addresses, and uh, they will be flayed alive uh, with their corpses left in the town square to rot as a warning to others in the future. <laughs> So uh, Federighi is going over iPhone 4 and later, iPad 2 and later, iPad mini, iPod Touch, fifth generation, um, 
All of this is stuff we've seen at WWDC, and he's at least blasting through this recap. He's not doing it tediously and, you know, moment by moment like they've done in the past, which hopefully means there's a lot of exciting stuff ahead. September 18th. September 18th is the day we can expect um, iOS 7, and uh, as with iOS 6, it will be a free download. Um, so uh, gird your loins, ladies and gentlemen. September 18th is the day that you'll be able to download all this goodness uh, for your iOS device. Woohoo! Yeah, and that's, that is the date we expected. Apple has typically released new iOS updates eight days after the event, and that's a good sign. Um, it is coming to the... There's no talk about whether it's coming... I guess they are releasing the iPad version on the same date. That was a big question mark. Some people thought they wouldn't be because the iPad version beta came out later than the iPhone version. Nope, iPad 2 um, and later an iPad mini get it on the same day as the iPod Touch 5th generation, um, iPhone 4 and later. Here's the bad news. If you've got an iPod Touch 4th generation uh, or an iPhone 3GS, you are out of luck. I, that shouldn't be a total surprise. That's keeping with what we knew at uh, WWDC as well, but uh, um, suffice it to say that if you've got one of those older devices, it's time to uh, think about moving to uh, to something a little more current. Now uh, they're showing off iWork right now, Peter. I know something near and dear to your heart. To your heart, and the icon looks all new in iOS 70, but the app itself looks pretty much the same. Yeah, indeed. You know, uh, we'll we'll uh, um, uh, we'll we'll see what changes they're making. Tim's talking about it right now. You know, uh, Tim says that. Uh, uh, that uh, that that I work for um, iPhone is is the best selling uh, mobile productivity suite, and that doesn't surprise me. If you take a look at Apple's top grossing apps um, in in the App Store, uh, the three apps that comprise iWork are almost always uh, in the top ten. People need that functionality, especially in the absence of Microsoft's Office, you know, in any sort of widespread availability. Um, on on iOS devices, and no, I don't think that that Office 365 app counts. <laughs> so there are some reports that the iPad version will be coming out later than the iPhone version, and some reports that it isn't. So we've got to double check that. Uh, so yeah, so we'll we'll keep you apprised as soon as we find that out one way or another. They're showing off all the iWork apps again. They do not look like they've been redesigned for iOS 7. That's not surprising because the Making iOS 7 has been such a huge amount of work that Apple probably doesn't have the engineers to update all these apps at the same time anyway. Yeah, and also, I mean, this is workflow stuff now, right? You know, they're making major changes to the operating system and the user experience that goes along with that. I'm not really sure that now would be the right time to completely throw out the baby with the bathwater and reinvent the way that people are actually working on these devices Oh, Peter, let well. me interrupt you, but he's showing off five apps. He's not showing off GarageBand. There's Keynote, Pages, uh, Numbers, uh, iPhoto, and iMovie, and those are all going to be free. All five of them are free, but the sixth app, I, GarageBand, has not been shown. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, the the free news is is terrific news for people who um, have not yet downloaded it, uh, have downloaded these apps. I, I'm sure those of us who have paid for them are going to feel a little bit ripped off, but hey, you know, whatever. They're free with any new iOS device. Um, so if you buy um, ostensibly a new iPhone or a new iPad when they're released, um, you're going to get these apps for free. And it'll probably be like the Mac where they're just there in your download queue and you're able to get them. I wonder if GarageBand is going to be different because Apple's introducing, the actually the only inter-app communication API they're introducing is an inter-app audio API. Uh, so maybe there'll be a new version of GarageBand to go with it that'll get some separate attention. Maybe so, yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a pretty safe bet. Um, so again, Apple hasn't made any hardware announcements yet. We assume they're coming shortly. Oh, right now. And there we I, go. Yeah, a couple of you may be expecting this. Ha ha. Very inside <laughs> baseball. <laughs> anyway, what I was just going to say is iPads, iPhones, and fifth generation iPod Touches, new ones, will get these apps for free. Yep. Everyone else still has to pay for them iPhone 5 had the most successful first year of any iPhone Apple has ever done, uh, is reportedly what Tim Cook is saying. 
So much for uh, the the naysayers who said that when the Apple fi- uh, when the iPhone five was first introduced, Apple had a dud on its hands. <laughs> yeah, now the the chart is curving off a little bit, but that's what you expect on any hockey stick. You get rampant wrap up, and then there's a point where you start getting uh, well. You you reach the what is it? The thermal dynamic limitations of the solar system we live in. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you, you, you know, the, the, but the bottom line is a lot of people are getting iPhone 5s and Apple, to its credit, made iPhone 5 um, available uh, uh, through a lot more channels than uh, than it had before. So oh, here we go, Peter. This year, we're not going to this year. We're not going to keep the old iPhone 5. We're going to replace it with not one, but two new designs. Ah, so the analysts who predicted that were correct. Yeah, iPhone 5 is no more. It makes sense on a lot of levels, and of course, Phil Schiller is coming out to take the stage. Um, and yeah, it makes a lot of sense because the iPhone 5 is an expensive product to keep producing, and and if you can save money on doing that with these two new models, that'll be a big win. So let's see what we have. They're going to show off the iPhone 5C, so the name was correct. There were some people doubting that the iPhone 5C would be the name, but I think we heard it so often by now that it was almost inevitable. We saw boxes with iPhone 5C stencils on it. We saw back panels with iPhone 5C stenciled on it. Yeah, it's uh, incontrovertible at this point. Apple has admitted that it's iPhone 5C. And they're showing off the iPhone 5C logo, which has the C in a little round rect box, just like the original 3GS did. I never understood that particular visual design. It looks almost like a chiclet keyboard key next to the number. Hmm. I don't know. I'm not a design expert, so I can't really speak authoritatively on that, but it doesn't bother me. iPhone 5C is the official name. Official name, and they're showing a video now. Oh, boy. So this is the time on our podcast when we make uh, hand puppets or shadow puppets and do an interpretive dance because there's nothing more interminable than sitting there in uh, an Apple keynote watching a video. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, they're usually very good. I mean, we often get, uh, you know, Johnny Ive. We used to get Bob Mansfield. I don't know if Bob Mansfield will do any more videos since he's retiring, or at least moving on to work on special watch-like projects. Oh, it's official. Green, white, blue, red, reddish-pink, sort of a salmon color, and yellow. No black, which, again, is no surprise, because black is usually the most popular color, and Apple probably wants to save that for their premium product. Absolutely right. Yeah. So I mean, these are these are the colors that we've seen before. Um, the the way that Apple is showing them off, the uh, desktop wallpapers actually match the colors of the cases. <laughs> and they're unibody plastic. The buttons are the same color and matching. It really does look like a hard, I'll say almost Nokia-like shell. You know, Apple did do plastic with the iPhone 3G and the iPhone 3GS, so it is not unheard of for Apple. And hope. You know, those did have a few issues, but hopefully the plastics have gotten better since then. Yeah, it's polycarbonate specifically. Polycarbonate is shatter resistant, although um, it is a little more likely to get scratched than um, uh, than than uh, the, the the backs that we've seen Apple use before. The front, though, is still glass, so uh, that hasn't changed. So they've still got incredibly durable Gorilla Glass um, style fronts. Yeah, same as iPhone 5, just with a unibody, and I'm typing this out as I say it, polycarb back, uh, and it's got a, a, a tasteful Apple logo embossed in it, so it's not a flush logo, and it's not printed on the way that the 3G or the 3GS was. Oh, no, is that a case? Oh, that is a case, a soft felt silicone rubber custom case that goes around it with the Apple logo on it. That's unusual to see Apple getting back into the casing business. They stopped that with the iPhone 5. Well, I think Apple wants to um, sort of give uh, case manufacturers, uh, and this happens sometimes, where Apple will try to give their third-party partners a sense of of where they want uh, design to go uh, for accessories for their products. And the whole idea behind this design is that it still shows off the color of the case, uh, but offers some perforated. It's got a, I can't, one, two, three, four, five by seven, it looks like, 35 (laughs) circles perforated into it. So you can see the color of your case. Um, yeah, and I guess you can kind of mix and match and figure out which uh, which color you want to go with uh, uh, with with the color of your phone. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it doesn't look great to my tastes. You know, uh, Phil Schiller says um, that as close as you look on these phones, you won't see any seams or part lines. 
uh, or joins. He calls it an absolutely gorgeous case design. Um, you know, they, they photograph okay. I'm going to be really curious to see them up close and personal to actually uh, see um, how they look. Uh, the, the, as I said before, the back case is made of polycarbonate material. It is hard-coated uh, to give it a little bit more scratch protection and resistance than it would have otherwise, which is good news. Yeah, and he's going through the specs right now, and they are identical to the iPhone 5, which is pretty much what we heard and reported uh, a couple weeks ago. Even though it's plastic on the outside or polycarbonate, it uses uh, steel reinforcement on the inside, and it's got the same multi-band antenna that you would expect an iPhone 5 to have. Now, it does, he is saying there's a new FaceTime camera, larger 1.9 micron pixels, improved backside illumination, and FaceTime audio. So Apple did, it looks like they did increase one spec, the, resol the uh, resolution of the front-facing camera. Hmm. FaceTime HD camera bumped in you quality. Know, fa FaceTime, FaceTime aside, I don't know in my, in my particular circle of friends many people who are using FaceTime, but the real advantage of having a front-facing camera is, uh, of course, to take selfies, and <laughs> lots of people love to take selfies. So I'm glad to see them make some improvements there. Now, they're also saying more LTE bands than any other smartphone in the world. So some people were thinking that Apple would cheap out on the radio and go back to 3G. I never thought that would be possible, uh, but they are going... They are, they are going LTE, and it's also going to be $9.99 for 16 gigabytes, $1.99 for 32 gigabytes on a two-year contract. So Apple didn't go free. They're maintaining some value uh, to the product, and $29 each for the cases. Worth you pointing mistake, Peter? What's that? What, staying on contract? Uh, staying at $99 bucks and not going free on contract. Well, I guess it really depends on what the iPhone 5C is going to cost um, unsubsidized. Um, you know, that that they haven't said yet. Uh, you know, $99 for 16 gigs implies that it's probably going to be somewhere, what, around the $400 mark, I would guess? We reported 450 as our best guess. Some people thought it would go as low as 200 or 300 but that doesn't seem like an Apple play. Mm. One thing that's worth pointing out, um, the phone has uh, 802.11n, uh, yeah. two, two, two point, uh, 4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. It does not have AC. Uh, no. There are certainly mobile uh, devices out there that have AC in them, uh, but the 5C does not get that uh, functionality yet, unlike the new MacBook Airs that came out in June. Yeah, and it makes sense leaving that. You know, they've, they've got to leave some high-end features on the high-end phone. Uh, apparently the video is airing now, and Johnny Ive is calling it a distillation. It is no aluminum, but there is a distillation. Sir Jonathan Ive, sorry. So I, I'm, I like this device. I mean, it's not the cheap iPhone that people wanted, but those are the same people who wanted cheap netbooks and, you know, cheap tablets, and Apple just has never done that. They made the Mac Mini, the iPad Mini, the iPod Mini. This is the equivalent of that in the iPhone lineup. Well, this tracks very consistently with what you and I have been predicting, Renee, which is that it was going to be a less expensive iPhone, but it wasn't going to skimp on features. That is really against Apple's DNA. You know, it's not within Apple's... Uh, uh, way of, of working to produce a product that's cheap, you know, that, 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 that is cut rate, that, that, that um, excises um, uh, core functionality um, just to get a lower price. That's not what we've got here with the iPhone 5C. What we've got um, is uh, a, a product that, that is almost identical spec-wise um, to the product that it's replacing. Uh, but um, clearly at uh, uh, a cost savings, at least for Apple, um, to produce. So, uh, you know, from that perspective, hopefully this will be something that Wall Street, at the very least, will respond well to. But I have a oh, feeling Wall that Street Apple, is doomed. Yeah. I have a, <laughs> I have a feeling that Apple is going to be very, um, uh, or that the consumers are going to be very happy with the new uh, um, iPhone 5C because it is a new thing, a new thing that they'll be paying last year's price for. Uh, Johnny Ive is calling it unapologetically plastic, and they took fanatical care out of it. It is a, a polycarbonate unibody, a lacquered hard coating. Uh, this is a great fun. I mean, the iPhone 5 up until today has been compared, uh, has been, uh, what's the right word? It's been competitive to uh, other more recent higher spec phones just because Apple makes it, you know, they make it from atom to bit, and that doesn't look like it's going to change. Um, I think this will also appeal to people for whom the original iPhone was a little bit too expensive, uh, or they just wanted something that looked a little bit different, and this is that. 
I can see families getting more iPhone 5Cs too. Uh, you know, I think a lot of parents have been reluctant to get their kids iPhones because they know that their kids are going to ruin it. Maybe a polycarbonate body, uh, you know, lacquer coated polycarbonate body is something that they may respond better to and say, you know what, that looks less delicate, it looks more durable than the product it's replacing or than the high end product. I can justify getting that for my kids. Absolutely, and Apple's really showing off the different colored cases and showing that you can do different color combinations, which is pretty, I mean, that's an interesting take because the whole show through the color, they're, they're showing, you know, looks like 30 different color combinations between cases and phones right now. And that's just Apple's cases. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we've already been flooded with uh, uh, press releases from companies that have announced iPhone 5S and 5C cases. Um, so you're, you're going to see, you know, a deluge of, uh, of, of possibilities uh, coming out in the coming days and weeks. And they've got all the LTEs, Peter. They keep telling us they've got more LTEs than anyone else on the market. Which all the LTEs! No, it makes a difference because there's 40 different LTE segments and it's very hard to support them all over the world. For the iPhone 5, it took three different models, including Verizon, to, to, to cover them. And the more you can do with the fewer parts, the better. That's absolutely right, Renee, and regular readers to iMore will, uh, may recall my tribulation getting my um, bone stock iPhone 5 uh, purchased from Apple working on T-Mobile's LTE network. It actually took a swap out in order to do. Um, so uh, I'm glad to see um, Apple kind of taking the, the bull by the horns and, and offering uh, one phone to rule them all, as it were. Uh, which color do you like best? You know, I I don't have favorites. I like to have variety, which means, I mean, I bought three different iPod Touches just so I could get a bunch of different colors. This is uh, this is hard for me. I don't know. There, maybe white, but there's a white iPhone. Am I going to go with something different? Yellow is not going to be as cool as gold. The red looks kind of, I can't tell, Peter. Hmm. You know, I wish there was a purple. If there was a purple, I would get a purple in a heartbeat. Yeah, Dalrymple was saying the same thing. You're both Samuel L. Jackson with his lightsaber all of a sudden. There you go. <laughs> iPhone 5S time. Nice. Phil Schiller is back. And this is the high-end feature, uh, sorry, the high-end flagship phone. The most forward-thinking phone anyone has ever made, according to Phil Schiller. And that usually bodes well for us. And again, it's got the button treatment around the S, which flabbergasts me. But, you know, it's Apple. What can you do? Come on, hockey hair. Give us another can't innovate my ass. I want to <laughs> hear a, another one of those. It's a Mac Pro phone. Mac Pro phone, that's it. Glistening black phone, shaped like a lipstick. Now, where the original, um, where the 5C video had glowing globs of plasticky colors melting, this one has liquidy metal stuff flowing around. Uh, and, of course, it is gold, Peter. Your dreams have been answered. They have come true. <laughs> Pardon me while I go drink a gallon of bleach. Smog likes cold. The dwarves like gold. Gold member likes gold. I can see there's no pleasing you. I'm all about the white gold and the steel. What can I tell you? Oh, there we go. The um, slate, gold, and silver. There is no graphite, unfortunately, although the slate looks kind of light in those pictures. So let's just put that up there. Silver, gold, slate. So gold is the new color. I'm getting the gold, unapologetically getting the gold. Uh, slate. slate is definitely on my list. Same camphored edges, uh, same high-grade aluminum. Uh, so there, it, it basically really is an S-Class product, and we can see in the pictures the dual LED flash, which they haven't spoken about yet. Oh, silver, gold, and a new space gray. So it's not slate. It is the, uh, the grayish color, which makes sense because black is so hard uh, to laminate that the slate uh, gray will probably be a much more sturdy product. Plus, people will know you have the new black one. Yes. And now we're going to go into performance, which probably means um, the A7 chipset. So the gray parts started leaking out, and props to our own Ali Kazmuha, who was talking about how the gray would probably replace the black. So Ali nailed that one. And they're showing the gold one off a lot, Peter. Is that just to mess with you? I think so. I think they're doing it just to piss me off. Now, Kevin Mitchelluk is in our chat room. He is our dear leader of Mobile Nations, and they had him at gold. Oh, Mark Gurman, 9 to 5 Mac, was correct. 64-bit, world's first and only smartphone, the 64-bit chip, 64-bit chip, can't even pronounce that properly, chip dip. 
<laughs> processor. I'm very interested to find out what 64-bit is actually going to do for a smartphone. I mean, do we really need that wide a pathway, a data pathway on these phones at this point? Yeah, so for people who aren't familiar with it, uh, the the 64-bit doesn't mean that it's necessarily faster, but it means you can take bigger, like if you're eating something, you're not eating it faster, but you're taking much bigger bites at the same time. So you will finish it faster, but by virtue of the scale, not of the speed. 64-bit desktop class architecture, modern instruction set, two times general purpose registers, two times floating point registers, one billion transistors, 102 millimeter die size. That's insane. Yeah, I mean, that's twice as many transistors for about the same uh, uh, size on uh, the same die size uh, for for the uh, the CPU. Twice as many transistors as the, uh, um, the A6 uh, chip that it's replacing. Native 64-bit kernel libraries and drivers, built-in apps are re-engineered, seamless developer transition, Xcode support, runs 32-bit and 64-bit apps, which is what they did. I mean, Microsoft and Apple took very different paths to 64-bit on desktop. Apple's was seamless to the end user. It looks like they're doing that again. It looks like the, the OS X roadmap repeated. Yeah, indeed. The, um, uh, the, the developer tools... Um, uh, for iOS 7 have been updated with the 64-bit stuff as well, um, uh, which will make the transition from here on out easier. And that 32-bit compatibility will make sure that uh, apps that are made for today's hardware should work on this new system just fine. Yeah, I mean, this uh, I'm interested to see what people do with this. I mean, on the desktop, a lot of us just wanted Final Cut Pro and Photoshop to work on bigger images and bigger video files, and I'm not sure what that advantage will give us in terms of, like, what is Apple going to do that 64-bit will make possible? Right, well, you know, this is compared to uh, the, the Android uh, uh, ecosystem where um, increasingly they're turning to quad-core processors um, to sort of differentiate performance. Um, I think oh, Apple. Peter, sorry again. Numbers over twice as fast again. Forty times CPU. Fifty-six times graphics improvement. Yeah, that's uh, that's great news. That's great news. Um, also makes me wonder long term about what backwards compatibility is going to be like as more people adopt uh, um, uh, uh, adopt these new devices. OpenGL ES 3.0. This might be better than our old Nehala Mac Pros, Peter. Wow, that would be disappointing. <laughs> I'm swapping it out. Um, but but no, like you're a gamer, and the amount like what you're gonna be able to pump through OpenGL ES 3.0 on a 64-bit chip with that kind of performance, it even has me a non-gamer salivating. Yeah, right. And uh, on the iPhone, okay, fine. Give me the next generation iPad. You know, give me an <laughs> iPad fifth generation with uh, with this hardware. And now we're talking. That's a pretty serious piece of gaming hardware right there. I would be able to cut people like Kratos with that thing. So Donald Mustard from Epic Games uh, is on stage right now. Mustard is um, uh, the, the co-founder of uh, Chair Entertainment. They're the ones who do Infinity Blade. Um, and so, we're supposed to do Infinity Blade Dungeon, but I'm not going to ask about that again. And uh, he is actually on stage with his brother Jeremy, and they are, or, uh, he, he mentions his brother Jeremy, and they're showing the epic conclusion to the Infinity Blade trilogy. Blade 3, which is, I mean, Infinity Blade was perhaps the game that best showed off graphical performance on previous generation iPhones and iPads. Yep, yep. They're For people eight. not familiar with Epic, Peter, that's, uh, is that a 3D engine? Uh, Epic Games is the company behind the Unreal Engine. They produce a lot of other games themselves, like Gears of War uh, and so on, but um, Epic Games' place in the um, gaming ecosystem is predominantly as um, a middleware developer, and they have been very forward-thinking about offering uh, iOS support, and uh, you know, Chair obviously plays into that. They acquired Chair, um, and, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, the Infinity Blade series has been huge um, on iOS devices. No, absolutely no doubt. Uh, and they're showing it off now, and they're saying five times faster, two characters. Uh, you can see the home button. It's got a gold ring around it, um, which, you know, a little bit of a tell, and it looks pretty much like the packaging leak. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm guessing the silver one will have a silver ring, and the black one will have a slate ring, so it'll all match, Peter. All right, fine. I'm not going to make the obvious joke there. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, if you like it, you could have put a ring on it. Um, 
so yeah, you know there are a lot of new new features in Infinity Blade Three that look really cool. Uh, here's an interesting sidebar. Uh, Donald Mustard said that converting to 64-bit usually is a really painful process for developers, but for them, uh, it took two hours with the new nice. tools. So if that's an indication, um, and, you know, one can't uh, extrapolate data from an anecdote, but uh, if that's any indication, then Apple is really trying to make this transition to the 64-bit um, architecture of the A7 chip as seamless as possible. Lens flare that would make J.J. Abrams proud. No, but exactly, Peter, and that's why I said Apple really did a good job managing the 32-bit to 64-bit transition on OS X, and bringing that over to iOS is so smart because people will be able to take advantage of it without having to worry, do I download the iOS 7, you know, 32-bit or 64-bit version? Which app goes with what? I mean, that was a huge headache on other platforms. That's right, yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, this ain't, this ain't Apple's first rodeo, so uh, <laughs> they have the knowledge of, of how to manage that effectively for sure. Uh, this looks like a great game. I'm guessing this is going to be on the top of a lot of games you have to have to show off your new iPhone 5S list. Yeah, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Infinity Blade has never really thrilled me as a game, uh, but tech as, demo? as a tech demo, <laughs> it is unbelievable. I mean, it really uh, shows what um, an iOS device can do. Um, uh, and, you know, it's, it, it, it certainly has been copied by many pretenders who um, sort of took the, um, the, 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 the swipe mechanic uh, for the hack and slash um, a get core gameplay mechanic in, in Infinity Blade and have repeated it many times, some successfully, most not very successfully. Unbelievable level of detail, though, in the textures, um, and, and uh, the imagery that we're seeing here. It's a really sweet-looking game. I mean, this is, you know, in some respects, console-quality graphics coming out of uh, a tiny little little uh, uh, phone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's, I mean, you've been writing about that. I've been writing about that. A lot of people have been writing about what these devices mean to gaming because we've got a Nintendo 2DS has been announced. PlayStation's got their Vita and now a Vita TV. Uh, but Apple is, they're, they're not gamers at heart. It's not in their DNA the way music is, but they've fallen ass backwards into quite a gaming empire. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely true, and you know, it. it, it I think uh, uh, Apple knew from the start that gaming was going to be important, but I don't think they understood quite how important it was going to be to the iOS ecosystem in the end. And it's going to be available in the App Store along with the new iPhone 5S, whose ship date has not been announced yet, but which historically would be available um, on the 20th of the month if Apple sticks to their same their similar patterns. Phil Schiller is back on stage, and he's talking about a new part called the M7 that's actually a motion coprocessor that works along with the A7. Which Clayton uh, Morris has been talking about for a while, so kudos to him. So motion coprocessor. What the motion coprocessor does, or coprocessor, if you're, if you're Canadian, if you're Canadian um, it actually enables um, uh, new... Uh, features and functionality uh, in the iPhone. Uh, specifically, Phil Schiller is talking about health and fitness apps because what it's doing is it's measuring motion data continuously. Um, you know, the accelerometer that we've had in the iPhone from the start that measures, you know, what orientation you got it in, gyroscope, compass support. Um, so uh, th this is... Uh, this is really cool. To tap into it, Apple has developed a new API um, called Core Motion, which identifies uh, user movement and um, uh, makes optimizations based on contextual awareness, according to the slide that Apple's showing. And, of course, Nike Plus is going to be there. Yep, Nike Plus Move is the new app from Nike. The new M7 coprocessor for motion health apps. Sorry, I'm lagging a bit in the live chat because talking is so much easier than typing. So Nike Plus Move um, uses the M7 chip and uh, the iPhone's GPS functionality, which I don't think has changed in, in uh, this revision, uh, to keep track of the activities that you're doing. So... Um, and it's integrated uh, into Game Center, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> What about battery life? Here's the thing. We heard earlier that battery life is going to once again be a big push for Apple like it was with the Haswell MacBook Airs. I heard earlier the A7 is going to be more efficient not and more advanced. And he's saying 3G talk time, 10 hours, LTE, and browsing, 10 hours. 10 hours, 3G talk time, 250 hours standby, 
40 cool. hours of music playback. So 10 hours video. So it's the standby time that's gone insanely better. That's really interesting. So if you're using it, you're still using it. But if you're not using it, and I mean, that, Apple provides very good battery numbers. Most other manufacturers will say 24 hours of battery life, and they imply that you're sleeping for eight of those hours and not using it. Now, Apple doesn't count that. They count real-world metrics. So what they mean, all these numbers, is you actually using your device. Uh, and that's fairly impressive. Camera time. Yeah, yeah, this is exciting. Uh, you know, a lot of people have been wondering what Apple was going to do with the iPhone 5S uh, for, um, uh, for, for the camera because this is an area that arguably Apple has dropped behind uh, some other companies with. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I'm just answering a, a reader question. You know, I have to say, Renee, as interested as I am in the M7 and the iPhone, you know, we've all heard rumblings of an iWatch. I'm really curious, looking further down the road, what Apple is going to do with this M7 technology and a wearable, because that, that seems like it's going to be a natural fit. Yeah, the slow, equitable journey there. So Apple... Um... Apple's saying that most people just want to take a picture. Like, you used to have to be a good photographer. 15% um, larger active area on the sensor, so we're back to the whole photon thing. Larger 2.2 aperture, so they didn't get down to 2.0. They only got down to 2. Point, sorry, up to 2.2. It's counterintuitive. Um, and a new, it's still a five-part lens system, but it's a new five-part lens system. And the pixels are 1.5 microns, which isn't quite as good as the two microns on the HTC One, but that's only four megapixels. You've got to reduce megapixels to increase microns. Uh, but it looks like a fairly interesting compromise. Indeed, indeed. Bigger pixels make for a better picture, according to Phil. Well, that was that whole Steve Jobs thing at the iPhone 4S event where he said, you know, it's all, not, sorry, the iPhone 4 event, it's all about photons. It's about capturing photons. Uh, and it looks like that they're continuing that same strategy now. And what Apple doesn't usually get enough credit for is the, the image signal processor in the in the A, A series chipset ends up making iPhone pictures better than pictures from camera phones that have better cameras because the post processing is incredibly important on mobile devices. On paper, a lot of the newer phones should have destroyed the iPhone in camera test, but they just didn't because their chipset was not as good as their glass. And it's almost like a, a roadblock between getting the best pictures. Talking about a dynamic local tone map now, which is great technology. Autophotocus matrix metering with 15 zones. So again, this is all image signal processor stuff. They used to do white balance, really, really good white balance, really good exposure. Now they're taking that to the next level. Yeah, he's he's comparing it to the uh, capabilities of a of a DSLR camera. Uh, I will see. Um, interestingly, uh, the um, uh, there's a new flash on the camera as well that Apple is calling True Tone. Uh, which uh, should provide uh, um, uh, more consistent uh, uh, tonal quality than than the uh, overly bluish white um, uh, flash that's on today's iPhone 5. Absolutely. I mean, they're showing off outdoor sky in the blues, fluorescent light in the, in the whites to blues, studio lamp in the yellows, incandescent light in the oranges, candle flame in the oranges, and they're, they're having a white and a yellow, it looks like, or a yellow and an orange. It's hard to tell from this angle, but they'll be able to use the flash to better the color balance. 1,000 right. unique variations, they're saying. Right. So, uh, you know, if you're thinking a little bit along the lines of the Philips Hue that uh, Renee likes to show off in his office every so often, uh, you're probably on the right track. Um, uh, th this, uh, this flash will actually change color uh, as the iPhone intelligently figures out what the best color balance will be uh, and adjusts accordingly. That's very clever technology. That's really cool. I might no longer look green in photographs. People will not assume I'm a Vulcan anymore. Yay! Or boo! <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, um, the people who are in the room are saying that the, the photos do look better. We will put it through its test. I'm sure a lot of people will put it through its test, so we'll see what real world is. Uh, but, again, Apple is fairly conservative when they make claims. Oh, here's something cool to keep track uh, with the, um, uh, the, the Lumia 1020. That's the 41-megapixel uh, phone. 
from uh, from from uh, Nokia. Um, it has auto image stabilization or OIS, which is very cool technology that should. Uh, uh, so see, I don't know. It's different though, because the um, the Nokia's and the HTC One have optical image optical stabilization. Optical image stabilization. Yeah. yeah, and it, it looks like this is still a digital technology. I mean, where would they put it? It's still you know in an enclosure that's in the same size. Yeah. So what this does is it's like HDR. It takes multiple photos, combines them for light levels, and then picks the sharpest one. Uh, there's a new burst mode. So it looks like this. Yeah, it's exactly what you said, Peter. There's chipset stabilization rather than an actually floating the sensor, um, the way HTC and Nokia do it. Now, camera nerds can argue about the um, the the efficacy of digital uh, image stabilization versus um, uh, versus uh, um, uh, versus the alternative. But uh, you know, the the at least for Apple's demo, the pictures that they're showing uh, do show um, some real nice improvements uh, in stabilization over where we're at now. Now, the thing with digital is you usually lose some of the outside as, you know, they, or you lose something from the image, either size or, or, or whatever it is. With the optical one, so far they've only been really good at low light with no motion, so they've been particular and not general, and Apple usually goes towards general purpose photography. Which makes sense, because that's how people use their cameras. So Apple's going to take bursts of photos, analyze them in real time, and then present you with the one it thinks is the best. So it's more automagicalness. Yeah, but what's what's interesting is that if it's an action sequence, it'll choose a few different ones for you to look at. So, um, uh, you know, it's it's still intelligently sort of picking out the best frames, but it's it's also giving you choices. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we knew Apple was going to do a camera demo. They've been doing them for many years now. Phil Schiller has been hosting them for a while. Oh, here we go. 120 frames per second slow motion. Um, which I think 9 to 5 Mac had posted about w much earlier on, and that will give you those silky smooth reservoir dogs. Um, uh, I forget that NASA movie when everyone is walking out from the spaceship, uh, any Chow Yun Fat movie. It, it, it just makes for very beautiful looking slow motion. Expect many more pictures of uh, cats doing backflips on the internet once the iPhone 5S is out in the world. Oh, yeah, I can hear Ali Kazmuha groaning already. <laughs> Uh, but it, it, it's I, I'm hoping it'll produce better overall video, smoother, cleaner overall video. But if you want that special effect, especially if you're loading stuff up into iMovie to make those trailers with, uh, it's 720p at 120 frames per second, so not 1080. 1080 is still the regular frames per second. Um, and they're going to show us some some samples now. I, it's it's kind of gimmicky. Um, I would put it in my gimmicky drawer. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, you know. It's cool, but I, I don't see it as something that I would use every day. We'll see it forever on uh, Vine and um, and Instagram video, and then it'll stop happening. That's very true. They're showing a beautiful jellyfish. And Schiller is saying it's still the camera to beat. And again, that's a claim on overall performance. There are camera phones out there, like the ludicrous uh, Nokia Lumia 1020, that will beat it in certain areas. Maybe still overall, we'll have to put it up to a test. Um, and there's a squirrel in honor of Andy Anatko up on the board. But it's, it's um, I mean, it, it is on paper, again, a, a pretty good improvement to the camera, given that they used the same um, casing as last year. How many megapixels? They didn't say how many megapixels it is. I'm assuming it's the same. It's going to be 8 megapixels because they very smartly decided to increase the microns. So what happens is a lot of companies, to make more megapixels, will slice up the sensor more into smaller pixels. And that means you absorb less light and you get crappier photos. So megapixel, after a certain point, actually makes for worse photos. I'm not going to mention any names, <coughs> Samsung. But what HTC um, is doing, I think, is smarter. And what Apple is doing is smarter. And that's increasing the size of the microns. Uh, Nokia is going all in on oversampling, you know, taking 42 megapixels and bringing them, oversampling them, bringing them back down. But if you're going to go for a camera sensor today, this microns is what you want. Uh, Phil's showing off a, uh, a huge panoramic shot, a 28 megapixel panoramic shot, and you can actually adjust exposure automatically um, as you go along now. So, um, uh, you know, obviously if you're doing a panorama shot, um, the sun, if you're doing like a, a, an environmental shot, a landscape shot, the sun is going to be in a different place in the sky from where you start as to where you end. Um, so that'll that'll produce a, a better balanced photo with richer uh, richer color and tones. Yeah, I had a lot of oh here we go secure. 
security. They're showing off a bunch of different locks. I wonder whatever they could have in store for us next. Hmm. I miss the old days when documents were actually paper and you could lock them up in places and protect them. Really, Phil? Really? Yeah, well, I mean, if you deal with HIPAA or if you're in, you know, the medical business, you still have to have local files locked in a filing cabinet. If you put them online, uh, you are opening yourself up to a lot of problems. That's right. Yeah, it's a world of hurt, to borrow a phrase from Steve. <laughs> a world full of baggings of hurt. Yes. So Touch ID is the name. The marketing leak is accurate. There is a new Touch ID uh, sensor. I don't know. What do you think of the name, Peter? Touch ID sounds fine to me. Better than finger time, that's for sure. Better than finger time. Finger time is uh, uh, just rife for way too much fun having. Yeah, and they've got a very iOS 7 fingerprint-looking icon. Now, the yeah, big question Johnny, here is how... Johnny, I've designed fingerprints. That's what your fingerprint would look like. Absolutely. You know, the big question is going to be how accurate is it? I mean, if they make it too precise, then you'll get false positives. If they make it too liberal, then you won't get in. So here's the specs. 170 microns thin, 500 PPI resolution, scan sub-epidermal skin layers, 360-degree readability. So you can't theoretically hold it wrong. Or at least unless you intentionally try to hold it wrong, Peter. That's right. <laughs> Uh, I guess, you know, I've heard that Apple tested it on tons and tons of people, and he's saying it can read in any orientation, so that's going to be a huge win. We're going to have to find out how reliable it is in real-world performance, though. I'm just going to pop I've, that in here. I've been watching the third season of Luther, um, the, the, uh, the show from the UK starring Idris Elba, and in the yep. opening uh, episode, um, there's a, uh, a, a suspect and a murderer who um, needs to be taken in for fingerprints, and he jams his fingers uh, in a blender to prevent it from happening. Hopefully nobody with the iPhone 5S will let that happen to them. So here's the, me the mechanism. It's a laser-cut sapphire crystal, a stainless steel detection ring, a touch ID sensor, and a tactile switch. The sapphire is so that it doesn't scratch. The stainless steel ring detects that there's a finger there, so it turns it on so it's not burning power all the time. Then you have the actual sensor mechanism, and then underneath that you have the home button's mechanical trigger. And it gives you this, I don't know how to describe it, the same sort of iOS 7 fingerprint success screen. I'm not exactly smitten with this success screen. Success. I would. I'm still hoping for Siri authentication, so I can have you know um, sneakers. Your voice. My voice is my passport. Authenticate me. You know, as I said at the outset of our podcast, I'm going to be very interested to see how um, Apple handles things like uh, um, like um, uh, IT management with this device, because um, uh, IT managers have to have some way of working around the passcode I, or the um, uh, the thumbprint. So it works for passcode authentication to get past the lock screen, and it works for your Apple ID. So you'll, for example, be able to use that to buy stuff from the store instead of putting in your laborious iTunes password. I love that. I'm so happy with that because I don't mind entering my uh, Apple ID uh, for reasons that I'm not going to go into for obvious security reasons. Uh, I don't mind doing it from a keyboard, but doing it from an on-screen keyboard is a real P-I-T-A. Yeah. Um, so th this will make my life better. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Johnny Ive is back on screen talking about not just rampant technology for technology's sake. That's my Jay Bennett imitation. Um, but it looks like it does a little bit more than some people thought. Some people thought it was going to be just lock screen. Uh, I'd heard lock screen for sure. I hadn't heard anything else, so I was one of those people. But it doesn't go as far as, uh, as for example, Passbook or digital wallet, which some people were really hoping that it would. It's sort of a middle ground, and that makes sense for Apple testing it out in its first generation. It'll be interesting to see over time if Apple opens up an API that developers can tap into to use this as a security uh, apparatus in their own applications. That could be big. Well, I mean, some people would like to protect their photos or their text messages or individual apps. Some people would like to be able to use this, you know, for the PayPal app or for uh, other apps that have commerce built into them. Apple's not usually very quick to open up APIs because Apple really believes that APIs should be supported for the long term. So, uh, well, at least most often. So maybe that, I mean, they haven't spoken about it yet. It's possible, but I'm guessing that would be later on. Mm-hmm. And they're showing, again, the video, all the different parts here. It looks... I can't tell if every phone is a gold ring or not, Peter, if it's color-matched. 
It can read multiple fingerprints. Now that's interesting. Uh, well, that's good for a family. So, for example, if your wife or one of your children wants it, they don't have to revert to the passcode. You can have them entered in the phone. And I'm assuming also your IT manager. <laughs> yes. Capacitive touch to read your fingerprints. Put that in there. Multiple fingerprint support. So Apple's pitching this as the most secure phone ever. I mean, and that's, that is something that people suspected, that Apple is going to make an enterprise play for this because, you know, BlackBerry's uh, historically been the, the most secure phone. I mean, there were NSA versions of Windows Mobile, uh, but passcodes don't always work. They're showing off the arch, the loop, and the whirl now, and it looks like it's built into the chipset level support. Security, um, security mavens may be interested to, to, to know that Apple has said that it will never, it's never, the, the Touch ID information is never stored on Apple servers or backed up to iCloud. It's very specific to the device itself. Um, so you don't need to worry about your fingerprint being um, uploaded to the internet and hacked by somebody. Or, you know, looked at by the NSA. Right, exactly. Also, the loop does look like it's color matched. The black one looks black, the gold one looks gold, the, st the uh, steel one looks steel. That Slate iPhone's looking good, Peter. Yeah, it sure is. So it's never been available on other software. Yeah, so that that is interesting, and that is a, a good thing when it comes to privacy. Now, Schiller's back on stage with the A7, the camera, and the fingerprint icons behind him. September 18th. I can't wait. Is that the date for, oh, for iOS 7? For iOS 7, that's right. Yeah. 64-bit, iOS 7, 64-bit, and supports Touch ID. Well, that's nice. If it didn't support Touch ID, it would not be very useful. So, yeah, so like you said, it'll probably be set up by IT with them having recognition. Uh, same prices as before. It's their most forward-thinking phone yet, which is an interesting slogan. Last year, it was the biggest thing to happen on iPhone since iPhone. 199 for 16 gigabytes. Uh, 299 for 32 gigabytes, 399 for 64 gigabytes. On a two-year contract, of yeah. course. No word on 128 yet. I'll put that in here. $9. Cases cost $49 each. So is the black iPhone gone for good now? It's white, slate, and uh, gold? Well, the slate is just more gray than black now. I see. Which, again, kudos to Ali Kazmuha because she's the one who said that it would be replacing the hard-to-anodize black version. There are new cases, $39 a piece. Um, uh, okay, they're, they're colorful cases. I'm not really smitten with them. Yeah, those are kind of fugly. There's also a special red case. Uh, Project Red, of course, is uh, Bono's um, uh, 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 AIDS awareness eradication campaign that Apple has been involved with for some time now. Um, and uh, they're continuing their involvement by making a special red case, the proceeds of which will go to uh, the Project Red charity. iPhone 4S is sticking around 8 gigabytes for free. That's interesting. Yeah, so the 5 is gone, but the 4S stays around. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting play. I mean, I'm not sure who they're going to target it to, and I don't know what that means. September 13th pre-order, I don't know what that means for the low cost. And September 20th, you can purchase both in the U.S., Australia, Canada. Yay, Canada! <laughs> and this is consistent with what we heard about before. We had heard rumors that uh, various... Um, uh, uh, cell uh, service providers in the U.S. and Apple itself were telling uh, their employees they couldn't take vacations um, later this month. So uh, September 13th is when pre-orders start. United States, Australia, Canada, China, France, Germany, Japan, Singapore, United Kingdom. I don't recall seeing China on the first run list before. That's a very good point, Renee. Okay. China. France, Germany, Japan, Singapore, UK. So, uh, interesting, uh, interestingly, Japan um, is going to get the iPhones through SoftBank, KDDI, and NT Do uh, Do Docomo. Uh, that, for the first time, I think. Um, NT.com is the first time, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, 100 countries. Um, 270 uh, carriers. By the end of uh, by the end of the year. So um, that that is a very big global launch for Apple. Yeah, a lot of questions in the chat room about specs. If you if Apple didn't mention them, assume they're exactly the same as the iPhone 5. So yes, Siri on both phones. Yes, Nano Sims on both phones. Uh, Tim Cook is back out. He's talking about uh, Apple values again. They think of deeply about the experience they want to create. It's not about packing in the features, which is a bit of you know slamming that basketball back at Samsung's face like they talked about their mother. There's no iFablet. I'm very disappointed. Uh, bigger iPhones sound like a next year thing. <laughs> Micro SD cards, uh, there is an adapter for the iPad, but really, uh, micro SDs are like floppy drives. If you're still using micro SD cards, then you've, you know, you've not kept up with, with the new generation of technology. They're, they have benefits, but their drawbacks outweigh their benefits. Uh, Cook is going over all of the products. I would actually like it if my camera got rid of micro SD and became an online camera. I mean, it's nice to have some internal storage for when I'm completely offline, but if I had a camera that ran iOS and just uploaded everything to Dropbox or to Photostream or whatever, I'd be so much happier. Have you tried the, uh, uh, what are those cards, the SD so, cards? With yeah, the, the MiFi. Uh, yeah, yeah, I forget what they're called. But they've they've I, been mixed. iFi? Yeah, I've, they've provided mixed results for me. Here's the commercial. Um, looks like a guy on a boat using a colorful new iPhone. Nobody wants 5 inches. People want 5 inch iPhones, but in the US, the smaller iPhones continually outsell all larger screened phones combined. Apple will probably have to address it, though, because more and more people are wanting bigger phones, especially in countries where people only have a phone, where they can't afford a phone and tablet, and they want something that's more computer and less phone, and that's where the phablet sort of um, fits in. And I'm guessing, again, we'll get that towards next year. Larger pixels, fewer pixels, same pixels. The micron, if you're talking about the camera, the microns got bigger, which is much more important than pixels. There's already way more pictures than you need to, pixels than you need to take a, a poster. Um, there's no need. I, I'm going to say that unless you're going to do subpixel, um, what is it called? With the with the uh, extrapolation when you when you bring them down to smaller sizes, oversampling. Unless you're going to oversample, you don't need more than eight megapixels on a phone. What you need is a really good aperture and a really good micron size. Cook is thanking everybody. It looks like it's a one-hour event, Peter. No iPods, unless there's a big surprise at the end. Oh, they're going to return to music. Maybe I spoke too soon. It's either a performance or an iPod. Removable memory, safe backup is all going to the clouds. Clouds are much better than local finicky storage. Oh, so it's before we close, is we really do love music. Music, as we said earlier, is in their DNA. And celebrating great artists. And here's John Mayer. No. <laughs> it's got to be Lady Gaga after that build-up. No, I'm just kidding, too. Oh, uh, showing the iTunes app logo, maybe an iTunes radio segue. There's a musical guest here. One day, Tim Cook will just rock it on the stage himself. That's right. Haul out a guitar and start to shred. There'll be fireworks all over the stage. Pyrotechnics. You can disagree with me about micro SD and expandable memory. It's a, people were upset when Apple ditched the floppy drive, when they ditched the optical drive. Um, it's Elvis Costello, Peter. Oh, boy. Elvis Costello is great. But again, there's there's just there's way more drawbacks to removable storage because you can't depend on it. Maybe there, it may not be there. It might be it's it's not an ideal solution, and it's not it's the past, not the future. That's right. Internal storage is the future, Charles. Not SD cards. They no longer matter. It's my best, one, Ian McKellen. One word: plastics. And Elvis Costello is telling us all to stay quiet. So, Peter, starting to wrap up on our end here, what do you think of the event? How do you think it's stacked up compared to previous iPhone events? Well, you know, going into it, I wasn't expecting a lot of surprises, and I was um, uh, not shocked uh, from that perspective. We got That was our uh, fault, though. I mean, we, spoil it. we, we should have had spoiler alerts all over the entire site for the last year. 
Right, exactly. No, for, for sure. Um, uh, you know, the bottom line is that we were expecting a uh, a new uh, a, 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 that we were expecting two new iPhones, and that's exactly what we got. Uh, big news for me was that iOS seven is going to be out in the world um, on uh, um, on September eighteenth. You know, and that's that's great news for uh, anybody who's got a compatible device uh, that uh, uh, that can work with it. Um, I'm not. I, I don't think that it's worth upgrading. Everybody should be upgrading on day one. Obviously, some of us are going to have to fall on that sword uh, to pave the way for the rest of y'all. But uh, um, uh, you know, take it as it comes. It's going to be uh, an, an interesting transition for sure, um, and it'll be interesting to see how many people uh, upgrade and how quickly. Um, you know, I, the 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 fingerprint sensor on the iPhone 5s. Uh, looks like a really cool piece of technology. Um, anything that Apple can do uh, to maintain uh, the level of security that um, um, uh, that that an iPhone has, uh, but make it easier to use, is a really good thing in my opinion. And if it's as foolproof as Apple says it is, then um, awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what what actually impressed me, and I don't know if this will get the the attention that it deserves, is that Apple doubled down this year. I mean, they are not introducing. Sure, they're both based on the iPhone 5 platform, but Apple, for the first time ever, is releasing two new iPhones. The 5C is not as ambitious, but it does come with a new manufacturing line. You're not just churning out one new model. You've got to basically double production capacity if you intend to sell a lot of units, which they obviously intend to do. And turning out some a product on the iPhone scale is not easy. Turning out two products at iPhone scale, especially new ones that require new manufacturing processes, absolutely not easy. The 5C looks like a better alternative than the 5 would have been if they just kept it around. At least a more differentiated one. We'll have to wait and see for off-contract pricing. The 5S has, you know, to, to say what Peter said, it was spoiled, you know, 12 different ways from Sunday, but it's still an amazing product. It's got, hopefully Apple is going to mainstream fingerprint scanning with this device. There's always a chance they'll Siri it or maps it, but, you know, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and really try to use it. I, iOS 7, even though they turned on a dime, made an entirely new interface uh, in a very short period of time. It's going to ship as fast as iOS 6 did last year, uh, which is certainly impressive, and... The phone's going to ship 10 days after the event, which is still very, very uncommon. We have sister sites with other platforms that wait months um, to find out, not even to get when the phone is coming out. So, and a lot of, you know, and this is all Tim Cook's specialty, I think, Peter, is actually kicking these phones out the door, and he continues to do an amazing job. Absolutely. You know, uh, regardless of what people say about Tim Cook, he um, uh, has got the Apple's uh, supply line uh Nailed, you know. It's and it, it's great to see the products come out so quickly after uh, after the initial announcement. The downside of that, of course, is that uh, you know that the uh, information coming from Apple supply lines is a lot more porous than it ever used to be. So, um, you know, that's why we're seeing leaks happen earlier. And some people, you know, uh, some people are, are not happy with that. They think it's Apple's fault that, uh, there, that, that there are more leaks than they used to, or they see it as some sort of failure on Tim Cook's part. Look, you know, the bottom line is there's not a lot that Apple can do about it when it's actually trying to move machinery that's this big uh, in the way that, that, um, uh, that you've described, Renee. So I, I, I am not surprised at all that we, we hear about a lot of this stuff ahead of time. You know, nothing in the iPhone 5C or the iPhone 5S announcements really struck me as uh, remarkable. Um, uh, the only really big surprise I thought there were there there was was uh, were some of the details on the camera. Uh, that stuff I, I don't think that we had really scoped out um, uh, in much detail ahead of time. So it's it's interesting to see that there. But um, you know, the rest of it is pretty straightforward. Interesting to see the iPhone 4S stick around, you know, especially because the iPhone 4S can't work at LTE speeds. You know, that's something that's for iPhone 5 and later. Um, so it, there's really a big division now between what you get for free and what you have to pay money for in the iPhone line. 
Now, what's interesting, we've got some questions in the chat. If you guys have questions, throw them up there, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Screen resolution is the same, 326 uh, pixels per inch. It's, the, it's retina display. Um, the, the highest density screens out there are 400, so Apple's not that far behind them. Still a fantastic screen because it uses in-cell technology. It looks like the pixels are inside the glass. Last year it was one of the most advanced displays in the world. It's still one of the most advanced displays in the world. Um, it's not as physically big as some other displays, but still a fantastic display. Uh, L simultaneous voice and data over LTE on Verizon. LTE does not do simultaneous voice on data. Even on AT&T and other GSM carriers, the data signal drops down to HSPA or you know DCHSPA, HSPA plus, whatever is available. Um, L because Verizon also doesn't have HSPA, they have ED EVDO Rev A, which does not support voice over data. Verizon and Sprint will just kill your data signal when you're talking on the phone. That's you know. Other carriers made the choice. Bell and Telus made the choice of adding HSPA to solve that problem. Verizon and Sprint did not. They went to LTE. So we're probably going to have to wait. Some, what some people do, what some manufacturers do, is put two radio chips on so they can keep one radio going on LTE and one on voice. Apple believes that battery life is more important than simultaneous voice over data, so they don't want to have two radios firing at once. Um, what that means is we'll have to wait for uh, Volti, which is voice over LTE, when, you know, and a lot of networks are doing this, everything becomes a data packet, everything becomes IP switched, there's no more channel switching going on, and that we're still a couple of years away from that for now. Yeah, uh, Verizon says that it's going to start rolling out Volti in uh, 2014, so um, that's... Uh, something to look forward to anyway, but that, that's, uh, that's, that's a next year issue, not a today issue. And about the megapixel on the camera, Apple didn't say anything, which makes me believe it's still 8 megapixel. The micron size went up, which is much more important than the megapixel size going up. Spoke about that quite a bit earlier. We did not get a release date for the GM. Usually it's the same day. Hopefully it'll be the same day. If they intend to put it in wide release eight days from now, I believe absolutely it'll be coming out very soon. It might just be a matter of polishing up something or another and then you know, pressing the, pressing the big red button at Developer Center to get it out. The focal length did change. It is 2.2. Uh, it's an f-stop 2.2 camera. It was previously wide. I don't know if they could go any wider than what it was. Renee, just to confirm, the tech specs page on Apple uh, on Apple's website does say that the iPhone 5s is an 8 megapixel camera. So it it, it has not changed uh, in 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 megapixel density. Uh, but as you point out, it's got the 1.5 micron pixels now, which should uh, produce uh, uh, better quality photos. Um, twenty-five percent lower in terms of pixels. That's true. Um, some people are saying that the screen—it is a smaller screen. It's a four-inch screen. It does not have as many pixels as a 1080p display uh, because they have more pixels. Same way the iPad has more pixels. When you're talking about screen density and the quality of the technology used, is what I mean by not far behind. Apple's in-cell LED I IS, uh, sorry, IPS display is still a phenomenal display. It's just small. Uh, I mean, small compared to other vendors who call 4.3-inch phones mini. Uh, Costello is finishing. There's a standing ovation, shaking Tim Cook's hands. Peter, did you say that Apple's updated their website with all the information? Yep, Apple's updated its information or its website with all the information on the 5S and the 5C. So if you go there now, you should be able to get more details. Nice. So um, they could have added... No, they could not have added... Well, I mean, yeah... Theoretically, Apple could do anything they want, but there's probably no need to add size to the screen this year. That's probably going to be a next year project. Uh, like I said earlier, if you look at the sales numbers for this year, Apple sold more iPhones at 4 inches in the U.S. than all large size phones combined, not just then one phone. They had most of the sales on, I mean, I forget, the first quarter on at and 9 out of 10 smartphones sold were the iPhone, and those are all four-inch or smaller displays. So yes, they'll eventually have to go there, but there's no pain there. I think this year, it was all about the iPhone 5C and getting a bit less expensive, and then next year, it'll be about getting bigger. The screen size, it, the density increased with the iPhone 4, the size increased with the iPhone 5, it'll probably increase again with the iPhone 6 every second year. Uh, Renee, it turns out that we were wrong, actually. Um, unlocked and contract-free, the 5C is 549 for the 16-gigabyte model. That's Ouch. a lot more. That's, a, that's $100 more than we were expecting to see it. 
I mean, some people had it at two hundred and fifty or three hundred and fifty dollars. That surprises me. I thought it would be four fifty. Nope. Four. It's it's five forty nine for the sixteen gig model. Six forty nine uh, for the thirty two gig model. No wireless charging or NFC. Uh, there's no need for NFC. So the thing with NFC is why would you need it? NFC, uh, near field communications. This is the thing. Do you think in terms of a chipset and then find features for it, or a feature set and then find chips for it? Apple, if Apple can do everything a competitor can do using non-NFC, like using Bluetooth, L, uh, low energy, it's one less radio to have in the device. And there's every indication. For example, there's been some leaks of iOS 7. You tap your iPhone to your Apple TV, and it automatically sets up your Apple TV. Most people would say that's NFC, but it's not. It's Bluetooth. So there's no point in having NFC. Uh, if you can duplicate that using Wi-Fi Direct or Bluetooth. Wireless charging, Apple is usually not the first one to implement everything, and there's PowerMat, and there's Qi, and a bunch of <coughs> uh, competing standards, and it's not ubiquitous yet. And until something's ubiquitous, I mean, arguably, Apple could make it ubiquitous by shipping 100 million phones with it on, uh, but it's not their priority. Again, I would look for that in the future, maybe. Richard, uh, Richard Devine is saying, holy hell to the iPhone 5C pricing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, by the way, iPhone uh, 5S pricing basically remains unchanged from the 5. If, if you're uh, getting it unsubsidized, the, um, uh, the, the 5S starts at 649 and increases by $100 uh, for each uh, increment of, uh, um, of, of storage capacity that you double. So the 32 is 749 and the 64 is 849 you know, NFC tags, that is not a mainstream technology. I mean, that's, that is a very niche technology, and Apple gains very little um, by supporting that. There may be a mobile payments play to be made with NFC, and the way Apple wrote Passbook, they could very easily update the, the framework to include NFC, but again, that might not be this year. That could be in the future when NFC is a more popular technology. Uh, Peter, I'd be interested to see what the price is on, in China. I mean, if they launch in China mobile, Maybe the price will be different there, especially um, you know considering the differences of that market. Well, there's been a lot of rumbling that one of the reasons why China Mobile and Apple have been at an impasse is because China Mobile doesn't want uh, to to have to pay the steep subsidization cost um, that uh, that mobile carriers typically do. Um, so uh, you know the five C certainly cuts a hundred dollars off there, and that does make a difference when you're talking about a potential user base of 1.19 billion people. Um, but uh, is it enough for China Mobile? I guess we'll find out in a few hours, won't we? Absolutely. So with that, I mean, thank you everyone in the chat room. We had thousands and thousands of people joining us, and it is absolutely um, amazing. And thank you so much for being here. You are once again uh, the absolute best community in mobile. Really uh, sexy looking. Absolutely. Uh, I am going to jump off here. I will be on Mac break with Leo Laporte, Andy Anatko, and gang. And I think about half an hour, uh, we will have much more coverage ongoing with iMore. Just stick to iMore.com, iMore.com slash iPhone dash event. If you haven't already, make sure you go right now to iMore.com and enter our contest. We are giving away uh, an iPhone 5S, uh, actually a $500 gift certificate to put towards one. So if you want a little extra cash to upgrade, I mean, if you're on contract, that's way more cash than you need. Go. All you have to do is leave a comment to enter. You'll find it on the front page, iMore.com. Peter and I will be back with an iMore show on Thursday, but we'll have tons of coverage between now and then. Peter, uh, thank you so much. Where can people find you? Uh, right at iMore.com, uh, sometimes at loopinsight.com, and on Twitter and app.net at flarg, F-L-A-R-G-H. And I'm at Rene Ritchie pretty much everywhere. I'm at iMore.com. For all of our shows, go to mobilenations.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Once again, we appreciate you joining us. These were Apple's 2013 iPhones. <laughs>